Hello, I'm continuing my reviews on the Godzilla series with Terror of Mecha Godzilla. Now, Terror of Mecha Godzilla came out in 1975, and this is the 15th film in the Godzilla franchise, and the film acts as a direct sequel to 1974's Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla. And the film is directed by Ashiro Honda, who of course directed the original Godzilla and directed several of the Godzilla sequels. And it's oddly appropriate that the man who directed the original film is directed in this one, because this was actually the final film of the original Godzilla series, what's now known as the Shoha series. Now, I don't think they intended for this to be the final film of the original series. I think they wanted to do more, but this was actually a flop at the box office. Like, this was the lowest grossing Godzilla film in Japan, so after this movie, Toho decided to lay the series to rest until they rebooted the series nine years later with... The Return of Godzilla, or Godzilla 1985, as it's known here in the States. This is also the only Godzilla film to be written by a woman. The screenwriter's name is Yokio Takayama. I'm sure I'm not saying that properly. Now, technically there are three versions of this movie. You have the original Japanese cut of the film, which I actually just watched for the first time a few nights ago. But then in 1978, the film was released in North America under the title The Terror of Godzilla, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense considering Godzilla is not the villain of the movie, but whatever. But this version of the film was heavily re-edited. Actually, this version was pretty much butchered by the American distributor. Now, unfortunately, it was this version of the film that I grew up watching. Later on VHS, it was returned to its original title, Terror of Mecha Godzilla and I actually have two VHS copies of the movie. But around the same time, there was another English version released on television by Henry G. Saperstein. This version of the film actually remains pretty faithful to the original Japanese cut, only it adds a ten-minute-long prologue in the beginning, inaccurately describing Godzilla's history. And the DVD I have comes with the original Japanese version and the Henry G. Saperstein version. I gotta say, if you're gonna watch this movie, watch the original Japanese cut. Now, Terror of Mechagodzilla is a strange one in the sense that it's in the style of the other 70s Godzilla films because during this period, Godzilla was at his goofiest. Like, during this time, the Godzilla films were being made almost exclusively for children, and during this period, Godzilla was an outright superhero. And this is very much fitting in with the style of the other ones. At the same time, it has a much darker and much more somber tone than the previous 70s Godzilla films. Now, don't get me wrong, it never gets quite as dark as the original Godzilla, but it's certainly much darker than the other Godzilla films from the 70s era. Like, the film is the dark Godzilla and the campy Godzilla in one movie. I heard the movie described as, what if Adam West's Batman all of a sudden went dark for one episode? Like, what if Christopher Nolan went back in time and directed an episode of the Adam West Batman? Batman series. Like, that's kind of how this feels, but for Godzilla. But I will say the darker tone of this movie doesn't always mesh well with the film's goofier elements. Now, what the plot of Terror of Mecha Godzilla is it picks up where Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla left off. Now, in that movie, aliens were trying to conquer the Earth, and they built a robot version of Godzilla as their weapon against mankind. But that movie ended where the real Godzilla destroyed Mecha Godzilla. So, this movie begins where Interpol agents are trying to recover the remains of Mecha Godzilla, which they believe is in the Okinawan Sea, but then their sub is attacked by a giant aquatic dinosaur. So, Interpol seeks the help of a marine biologist named Akira Ichinose, I think I'm saying his name right, and he helps them investigate into what this creature could possibly be. So, him and an Interpol agent, who is also a college friend of his, start looking into a scientist named Shinzo Mifune. Now, we soon learn that Dr. Mifune was ostracized from the scientific community for his theories of a dinosaur which he called Titanosaurus. 
But it appears that Dr. Mifune's theories might have been correct, and they go to see Mifune's daughter, Katsura, who claims that he's dead. But we soon learn that Dr. Mifune is very much alive and is working with the aliens from the previous film. Now, the reason he's working with the aliens, one, he's insane, but also because he owes his daughter's life to them. His daughter, Katsura, was actually killed in an accident, and they brought her back to life as a cyborg. Now, Katsura also has a psychic connection with Titanosaurus, and at a certain point, the aliens install the control mechanisms for Mechagodzilla inside her body. So, now they're using her to control both Mechagodzilla and Titanosaurus, and the aliens want to use these monsters to destroy Japan and presumably the rest of the world. And throughout the film, Dr. Ichinose and Katsura start to develop a romantic relationship without him realizing that she's actually a cyborg working for the aliens, and now she's torn between her loyalty to her father and her love for him. Now, Godzilla's actually not in the movie very much, which might disappoint some people, but when he does show up, it is pretty awesome. Titanosaurus is also a really interesting kaiju, and is also a strangely sympathetic character, because you realize that it was originally a gentle creature, but the aliens have kind of forced it to become in this violent creature. And of course, Mechagodzilla is badass in the movie. But the film has a real emphasis on the human drama, so in a way this is kind of a return to form for the Godzilla series. And sure, the basic premise of the movie is silly, but the film treats it almost as a tragic love story. Now, the character of Akira Ichinose is played by... Katsuhiko Suzaki, again, I'm sure I'm probably butchering his name. Now, this actor was also in Godzilla vs. Megalon as a different character, of course. Now, I will say the romance between him and Katsura is not the most developed thing in the world, even though it is the crux of the story, and the line, I still love you even if you are a cyborg, is pretty freaking cheesy. But Suzaki plays this character very well. I I will say, I particularly like the scene where his friends start to realize that Katsura is not who she says she is, and he refuses to believe them. Now, in the film, Katsura is played by Tomoko Ai, I think I'm saying her name right, and she's easily the most compelling character in the film. Now, in the film, she is technically a villain, but it's not her fault, and by the end of the movie, she kind of becomes the true hero of the film. And she's a very sympathetic character because she was basically turned against her will into a cyborg. And much like Titanosaurus, she's forced by the aliens and to a certain extent by her father into being a villain. Now, in the film, Dr. Mifune, who's really the main human villain of the film, is played by Akihito Hirata, who's been in many of the other Godzilla films prior to this, always as different characters. Now, even though Mifune is definitely a villain in the movie, he is a very tragic character because you realize him being ostracized from the scientific community didn't just ruin his life, but it also ruined his family's life as well. And that's really what drove him insane and made him feel like he had to collaborate with the aliens. Now, there are certain moments in the movie where Akihito Hirata is very nuanced in his performance of Dr. Mifune, but then there are moments where Mifune is very over the top, and they even give him the stereotypical mad scientist look. But regardless of how cartoonishly over the top he is in some scenes, he's still one of the most complex villains of the Godzilla franchise. Also, I do want to point out that Kenji Sahara, the actor who holds the record for being in more Godzilla movies than any other actor, has a small role in this film as a general. Now, you have the aliens in this movie who are a lot more developed than they were in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, where in this movie you actually find out what their motivation is. Basically, their planet is slowly being sucked into a black hole, so they're trying to conquer Earth so they have a new home. 
home. So you get the idea that these aliens are basically driven to the point of desperation, but I will say the aliens in this movie, despite having ridiculous helmets, are actually pretty freaking scary. Like, you find out in the movie that they're keeping prisoners of people who tried to stop them in the past, and they actually mutilated their prisoners, like they cut out their vocal cords and shit. And in the movie, there's this scene where the alien leader is whipping his men for failing him, and maybe it's just me, but there was something kind of creepy and weird about that scene. Now, in the first Mechagodzilla movie, when you saw the aliens in their true forms, they looked kind of like apes. But in this movie, when you see one of the aliens in his true form at the end of the film, he looks like something a little more horrifying. You could call that a retcon if you want. My personal theory is that these aliens are basically shapeshifters, and even the ape forms are not really their true forms. What kind of pokes holes in my theory, though, is how come some of the aliens, when they die, revert to the ape form, and how come some of them, when they die, revert to this sort of mutant form? Now, I definitely gotta talk about Akira Ifakube's score for this movie, which is probably his darkest and most somber Godzilla score since the original film. But Terror of Mechagodzilla, I do think, is a very good movie. It's not one of my favorites, but I understand why fans love this one so much. Again, for me, what kind of keeps this movie from being a masterpiece is the fact that the grim tone doesn't always mesh well with the film's campier elements. But it is a good one, and I do think it's a worthy swan song of the original Godzilla series. And the fact that this was the final Showa Godzilla film, the last shot of Godzilla in the movie is actually kind of melancholy. So, that was my review on 1975's Terror of Mecha Godzilla. My next movie review will be 1984's The Return of Godzilla, which kickstarted the Heisei series.